Good morning again from my side. It's so good to be with you all today as we continue our series called Purposeful Parenting. Now, who, if you're a parent, raise your hand if you've used this phrase in parenting, okay? Do as I say, not as I do. Come on, be honest. Okay, who at least has heard that phrase? Okay, so some of you were like, no, I would never do that. Come on, we all do it. So the interesting thing is we would love for our children to do as we say and not as we do because we're not perfect, none of us, right? But it turns out that children actually do both. They sometimes do as we say and sometimes they do as we do because children learn and imitate behaviors by watching and listening to others. That's called observational learning. That is the way most of us learn naturally. We hear what others say, we see what they do, and we learn from that. And children learn from models all around them. Children don't just learn from you as parents, but they learn from watching and listening to television, to their friends, to teachers, to social media, to whatever there is in the world They get all of those models and they listen to them and they learn from them. I'm always surprised at Abigail, my five-year-old, how she picks up stuff that we didn't teach her. Okay, so our, our first language, our home language that we speak at home is Afrikaans, not English. So she grew up like that in South Africa. Our church was English, so once a week she would be exposed to English because that's the marketplace language. But 95% of conversations Abigail would have heard growing up would be Afrikaans. Yet by the time she started speaking, she spoke Afrikaans and English almost equally well. Just from that hour on a Sunday at church, from watching television and things, she picked up on a language that we didn't teach her. Well, quite frankly, we didn't teach her Afrikaans either, right? She just picked up on it. But it's incredible how kids pick up on stuff. But that's also worrying to me as I realize that kids pick up what they see and they hear from things around us that might not be good for them. And are we hopeless when we live in a world where there's so much information and so much voices present in our lives? Are we hopeless and just kind of have to surrender our children to whatever behaviors they pick up? The answer is no, we're not hopeless. Because not only does children pick up on what we do and what we say, but they pick up on something else. They pick on the rewards for certain behaviors. So researchers have said that the behavior children imitate depends on the type of reinforcements these behaviors get. So if you reinforce good behavior in a healthy way and you, reinf- and, and you discipline when it's not good behavior, they will imitate and they will continue to do the good behaviors that they received reinforcement for and they will hopefully drop some of the bad behaviors that they received discipline for. So at the end of the day, it's not just exposure, but exposure plus reinforcement that shapes who they become. And today, our second second part in the series on purposeful parenting is called the exposure principle. The exposure principle. And what we are doing in this series is I am not giving you tactics on how to raise your children. Because normally when you talk about tactics in the world we live in, people get quite upset because it's my children and I can raise them my way, right? Or some people actually do want the tactics because they say like, I don't want to do the hard work. Just tell me what I should do and I'll do that. The reality is that there is a principle on which we should base as Christian parents our parenting. But tactics are not the same, not for each parent and not even for every child. So therefore, we are covering principles, biblical principles, that forms a foundation on which, as parents, you can build your tactics in raising your children. But get the principle wrong, and the the tactic will also lead down the wrong path. If you're here today and you're like, Louis, I'm not a parent, 
I'm still in school or something. I don't even think about, um, about marriage, never mind children. Or maybe you are just a young person who hopefully will be married one day, but you don't have children. Or you're an, a grandfather or someone that doesn't have a child in house anymore. You might be like, what does this have to do with me? I want to say this principle specifically today is very significant to everyone in this room and everyone watching online. Because it's not just your children that are exposed to things and are shaped by those things, but each and every one of us daily are exposed to things that shape our lives. So therefore, I want to encourage you, whether you're a parent or not, whether you're a young person or an old person, it doesn't matter. Pay attention to this one because it matters to every single one of us. We're going to read today from Deuteronomy. If you've got your Bibles, it's the second book in in the Bible, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to verse 9. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. It will also be on the screen so you can follow along. But Deuteronomy 6 is called the Shema, and it was a crucial part of Judaism. It formed part of a prayer that they used to pray in the mornings and in the evenings, So this was a very, very significant piece of who the people were in the biblical times, and it helped shape them. And we're going to read from this this morning and see how it can shape us and help us with this exposure principle. So let's read from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 to 9. This is now God speaking. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Oh, this is Moses, sorry. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commandments I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and where you're on the road, when you are going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's what we're going to read today. It's interesting to me that when we read this, like it's almost like these two separate pieces. Almost like three separate pieces. The first verse 4 just starts with God is God and there's no other one beside him. And I think that is so relevant as we are talking about raising children. Last week, we read the psalm that says children are a gift from God. They're not just a byproduct of sex or something. It is a gift from God. And if they are a gift from God, it means that if we want to find out how to treat this gift that God has given us, we should go back to the one who's given us the gift. So parenting, I do not believe, can start and finish well if it doesn't start and finish with God. That's where he starts. But then we read further in verse, from verse, um, verse 5. And the interesting thing is that before the Shema talks about how we expose our children, it talks about our own priorities. It talks about our own heart. It says that we should love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. Jesus also said, with all of your mind. And then it says that we should commit to him and his commandment wholeheartedly. So it means that as a parent, every single aspect of ourselves, our emotions, our spiritual life, our physical work, our mental mental capacity, everything should find its center in who Jesus is. And our commitment to Jesus is not as an add-on or a byproduct of something, but our commitment to God should be wholeheartedly. Now, I know I'm starting out quite heavy here today, especially if you might not be a Christian, but I want to tell you today that if you cannot commit to that first, if you cannot commit to giving and following Jesus with your whole heart, Do not expect your children to do that. I read this study that was done for a a book um, called Becoming Soulmates with Your Children by Robert and Deborah Bruce. And they did some research on children that became Christ followers as adults. 
And here's what they found. If mom and dad went to church regularly, 72% of their children follow Jesus as adults. 72%. If dad on his own went to church regularly, 55% of children still followed Jesus. If mom goes to church on her own, only 15% of children follow Jesus as adults. And if neither mom nor dad goes, only 6% of children will actually become followers of Jesus as adults. If you do not take your relationship with Jesus seriously, don't expect your children to do that. This is the first thing I want you to understand today. That if, as parents, your spiritual lives have a profound impact on your children. There is no one with greater impact on your children's spiritual life than you. I don't have a bigger impact on their spiritual lives. Anna, our kids director, doesn't have a bigger impact on their spiritual lives than you do as parents. Because in the early years of parenting, no one has greater influence. You are with your children. Your children look up to you. Your children copy you. That is just the way God made it. And therefore, it is so important that your relationship with Jesus is solid. And last week, we spoke about this as well. A marriage cannot work properly if it is not Christ-centered. That's the principle. God designed us to work in a specific way, and His design always points back to Him. You will pass on to your children what you value most. And your children don't just become what you say, but also what they see. So you can say every day that you're a Christian. You can say every day that you read your Bible. But there is nothing that will chase them away from all of this faster than if you are hypocritical. If you say you're a Christian, if you say they should do certain things because Jesus expected of them, but you live differently. That will chase them away. And therefore I think when we talk about families, I want to tell you today, I do not believe that being a Christian family is enough to get your children to Jesus. The answer is not being a Christian family. The answer is being a Christ-centered family. And why do I make a distinction? Here's the distinction. A Christian family believes in God. God might be a part of their lives. But they probably only go to God out of tradition or when trouble comes knocking at the door. A Christ-centered family is different. A Christ-centered family loves God. They see following God and obeying Him as the highest calling in life. He's not part of their lives. God is their lives. And I think if we can't be a Christ-centered family, we shouldn't expect to pass something on to our children that they, they don't see in our lives as our highest calling. So the exposure principle, if you ask me today, Louis, where does it start? It starts with your own heart, with your own commitment to Jesus. Maybe you're sitting here today or you're listening to this online because you want some parenting advice, but you're not a Christian. Then I want to ask you today, I want to urge you, sort that out. Find Jesus. Because the fact that you're listening to a Christian preacher talk about parenting, the fact that you're in a church building today means that deep inside of you, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, you know that what is out there is not working. But what is in here can only work if Jesus is truly the center of it. So sort your relationship with Jesus out first. And if you want to start that relationship with Jesus, we won't throw you in on a deep side and leave you. We are here for you. Speak to one of our staff members. Speak to one of our elders or to a small group leader if you're in a small group. We will help you on the journey so that you can sort out your relationship with Jesus and then help your children on it. That's where we start. Exposure principle starts with your heart. But I want us to quickly look at what's going on in our world. What are our children being exposed to? What are we being exposed to? 
And is that in line with what the Bible says? I read this article from the National Center for Biotechnological Information. And it starts by saying that the average Canadian child watches plus minus 14 hours of television per week. Like, that's two hours a day. That seems reasonable, right? Here's the problem. They found that by high school graduation, the average teen will have spent more time watching TV than being in a classroom. Can I think about how many hours my child spends in a classroom and how many hours I'm actively investing in my girls' lives? And I'm getting worried because the balance starts going the other way, away from me as they grow up, right? Here's the problem. They say that the amount of time spent on screens, so that's the TV, computer screens, cell phones, tablets, can affect and hear this. Do you remember how the Shema said how we should love God? With every aspect of our being, the amount of time spent on screens can affect the child's postural development. You now, forward head position, thumb issues, it's all a reality in, our life, in the world that we're living in. Contribute to obesity and form addictive behavior. That's all the body. It physically affects this body that God has given me. But more than that, it leads to, the, to undeveloped social skills. My soul, my emotion, which connects to other people, is affected by it. I can't effectively communicate and connect with people because of all of my time in front of screens. But more than that, they also found that it have harming effect on learning and academic performance. My mind, it is literally affecting my mind. And I think back to Deuteronomy, love God with your soul and with your body and with your mind. And I'm like, this is intruding on all of those spaces. This is completely secular research, and they said that watching certain programs may encourage irresponsible sexual behavior. And then they said this, but they quoted such an old study, and this actually scares me. They said, today, TV is the leading sex educator in Canada. Here, here's a stat they quote. Between 1976, I wasn't even born yet, okay? And 1996... I was still in primary school, there has been a 270% increase in sexual interactions during the family hour, like on screens. It was like when I was little. I can remember when Titanic came out in South Africa. People went crazy because of just some scenes on Titanic. I'm like, compare it today to television and it's nothing, right? So I do not want to see the stat from 1996 to 2006 or to 2026. We know that the mental health of teens have been rapidly degrading since the launch of social media. There's been many studies done on the increase of self-inflicted harm and teen suicide that correlates with the rise of social media. There's just some school boards that have sued Facebook and other people for the damage that they feel it's doing to their pupils. Research study of American teens between age 12 and 15 found those who use, that they use social media, when they use social media more than three hours a day, they faced twice the risk of having negative mental health issues like depression and anxiety. Just being on that doubles your chance of facing depression and anxiety. For girls specifically, things that they are concerned about is cyberbullying related depression. Bad body image, 46% of girls in this age bracket said that it made them feel worse about themselves. Half of them. It leads to disordered eating behaviors, poor sleep quality. The reality is that for many years, television, the internet, Hollywood, social media, screens have been the, mo the thing our children are most exposed to that has been shaping their lives. Not even to mention friends and political agendas and all kinds of things like that. God's principle 
for exposure in your children's lives does not start with all of this around us. It starts with the parent. That's what we find in Deuteronomy. It starts with you as a mom and as a dad. Because the reality is, whoever and whatever you expose your children to will shape who they become and what they believe. And it's either going to be the internet and screens, or teachers or political agendas, or it's going to be you. But whatever they are exposed to will shape who they become and what they believe. So if they're exposed to bad attitudes and over-sexualized images and materialism and perverted thinking and prejudice and ungodly behaviors and values, they will become those kind of adults when they grow up. And I know we cannot force our children to one day love God, to grow up, to love Him. But we can expose them to God's Word, to people and experiences that will increase the likelihood of their spiritual growth. So let's go back to Deuteronomy. Verse 7 and 9 of the Shema says, When it comes to our families, we should talk about God repeatedly. And then it's like, oh, you don't get what I mean by that? So, that, so he gives you a bit of explanation. At home, on the road, going to bed, and getting up. And then he says, and make it visible. So tie it to your hands and to your forehead, at the doorposts of your house and at your gates. So in your house, at your places of work, in the city, it should be visible in our lives. Guys, I honestly believe that the church is bleeding young people today, the Christian church in the Western world, because parents have not physically shown their love for Jesus in their lives. It hasn't been visible. They haven't exposed their children to it. Let me ask you, who's in here today, you watching online, how do you prioritize your, your time on Sundays? That might be an easy answer. I give an hour to go. How do you prioritize it during the week? If sport and TV and school and hobbies are elevated to a place of idolatry in our lives, elevated to a place where it overrides the things of God, our Christian responsibilities, we show our children, we tell them by our words or by our actions that Christ is secondary to all of these things. You teach them that you only have to live for Jesus when it's convenient to you. You teach them that it's okay to sacrifice time with the all-satisfying Savior if something more fun or something more important comes along. I've said this before, and I honestly think we're bleeding young people because when they look at the faith of their parents, many children have seen a dead religion. But let's get positive. How do we expose them to the right things? Things that will position them to find and follow Jesus. How do you expose yourself to that? Three things. Okay, this is not on the screen, so if you take notes, you have to write down quickly. First, show them Oh, let me first say this. Sorry, I want to read you this stat quickly before we go to that, because otherwise I'll, I'll miss something. Lifeway Research did a study with, um, with parents who successfully passed their faith onto their children. So they looked at families whose children were followers of Jesus as adults. And here's the activities, the physical things they did every week. Okay, Here with this quickly, and then we'll jump into the three things you can do. They were reading their Bible several times a week. They took part in service projects of the church and mission trips as families. They shared their faith with unbelievers. This is the parents doing all of this and including the kids. They encouraged teenagers to serve in the church. They asked forgiveness when they messed up as parents. You thought forgiveness is a weakness. They encouraged their children's unique talents and interests. They took annual family vacations. They attended churches with teaching that emphasized what the Bible says, not just what we want to hear. And they taught the children to tithe, to give of their money to the church and to God. 
this was the most common things those parents had in common. So how do we do? Three things. One, expose your children or expose yourself to the joy of knowing God personally. We have to create environments in our houses where talking about God is normal, where it's the norm, where I don't have to get my kids to talk about God, but where they want to do it. Make talk about God normal. Make it the most common subject in your house. That is what verse 7 said, right? Talk about Him regularly. At home, on the road, when they get up, when they go to bed. So it means at home, that should be part of your conversations. If God is not a constant part of it, there is a gap. When you are driving them to school or you're driving them to sport practice, it should be part of your conversations. When they go to bed, so before they go to sleep, that should be the way that they end their day. When they get up, it should be the way that they start their day. If we don't intentionally make it part of every aspect of our day, it's not going to happen. So as parents, you can model to them. Not only you create that space for them by modeling, by talking about it, but also by modeling in your own life what it means to talk to God and what it means to read His Word. They need to see you praying. They need to see you reading your Bible. Share with your children about your walk with God, how He's been forming you, about what He's been teaching you. And read the Bible and pray with them. Guys, my parents weren't perfect. But my parents passed on these kind of exposures to me that I'm passing on to my children. And I'm not perfect, but I know that these things set us up for the most, for the biggest chance of our children knowing Jesus. Every single meal that we ate together as a family, we sat around the table, we held hands, and we've prayed. Anyone who's had a meal around our table, sorry for holding our hands. We didn't know it's not a Canadian thing. We still do that as a family. We don't eat if we haven't prayed. And it's not just about thanking God for our food, but at the start of the day, it's about praying for the day. We include God in our meals, and it starts with a posture of thankfulness. Every single evening before our girls go to bed, we pray together. And initially it was just me praying, and then I started asking them, and it would start out by saying, okay, I'm going to pray, and you're going to repeat. Now, Annabelle, my two-year-old, she can, uh, she's okay with the words, but they're not great. And she's not like, nope, I want to pray on my own. And I'm like, you pray. And it's about two minutes of just random babbling, and I have no idea what she's saying, but she loves to pray, and I know God knows her heart. So I let her pray. Because it should not be the exception in our house. It should be the norm. When anything happens to Abigail's friends or anyone she knows, someone hurt their toe because they kicked the soccer ball wrong. She's like, let's pray for their toe. And she fully trusts that God will heal her toe. The faith of a child. I want the norm, not the exception. The second thing you can do is to firstly expose them to the joy of knowing God personally, not just to know Him through church or whatever, but personally. The second thing, exposing to the beauty of Christian community. That is the church. Because you and I are not the only influences that our children need in order for them to one day get to know Jesus, to live the life that God has made them to live. They need multiple exposures, good and healthy exposures in their life. And that is why Christianity is not a private religion. It is a personal decision that I have to make to follow Jesus. But Christianity in the Bible is always lived out in the body of Christ, in His church. Hear what Psalm 92 verse 12 to 15 says. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, The Lord is upright. He is my rock. and There is no wickedness in Him. Where does fruit, where does The greenness, the beauty, the flourishing come from. They say from being planted in the house of God. Old Testament, it was the tabernacle. Then it was the temple. Then it was the synagogue. 
And finally, when the Christians were kicked out of all of that, it became houses. And then it became bigger buildings again. But the church, the house of God, is not a physical building anymore because the Holy Spirit has been poured out. We, the Bible says, the temple, and together we form the church. So it's not about bringing your child to a building but showing your child what it means to be part of this group of people that's a spiritual family. Kirsten Black, she's a Christian counselor and a wife to a church planter. She wrote an article in for Acts 29, and she said, if we only prioritize corporate worship, so being together as a church, when it is convenient, let me read it again, If we only prioritize corporate worship when it's convenient, our children will learn to do the same. Let's go back to my earlier example. A Christian family goes to church when it's convenient. When there's no sport, no good weather. A Christ-centered family makes it a priority in their lives. They are part, they are planted as the psalm says, in Christian community. So what is, maybe you said, but I don't want to force my children. What is optional in your household? Is going to the dentist optional? Is going to school optional for your children? What about the team, the league that they sign up for? Is practice for that optional? You make decisions for your family every day, and this is a decision that you can make as well. But when you prioritize other things, even their things over church, but you never prioritize church over those things, you show them what truly matters, what values, and it's not God and His church. So show them the beauty and the value of the body of Christ by being planted in it. You can't pick their friends. That's a scary part for all parents. But you can influence the environment you put them in so that they can pick good friends. And at Grace, we have great kids and youth programs. We've got kids' church going on downstairs. We've got youth small groups on Wednesdays. We've got youth socials once a month at the moment on Fridays. We've got outreaches and mission trips. And we hope to soon start an internship program at our church for for kids who's finishing school, teenagers. We don't do that because we have to, because that's a churchy thing to do. We do that to create environments where they can best be positioned to find and follow Jesus. If you don't show your children that those things are important, they won't value it themselves. But in a spiritual community, when they're part of this, your children aren't the outcast anymore. They're not the only weird ones for believing in things like not drinking too much or saving themselves for marriage or serving Jesus. Suddenly, they're not the outcast, and it moves from just my faith to our faith, and it strengthens them. I love the church because I grew up in it. My parents never forced us, but we knew it wasn't optional. Before, at the second church that my dad was at, I was still a little boy, not even in school, and we didn't have a building yet. It was, the church was in a school building, and, some, and we would go early to set up and everything. I, I would sneak out and go and hide in the garden. We had this weeping mulberry, and, and the branches went all the way to the grass. So I would climb in there, and no one would know where I was. But I, I knew Afterwards, I would be in so much trouble. So next week, sometimes I would try it again, but other times I would just be in the church. But I have all of these memories of how it has been part of my life, how church and that community, from Sunday school to youth groups to the band, was always my community. And that's why I still love this community. So the third thing is expose them to serving God passionately. You see, exposing them to your relationship with Jesus and exposing them to the church isn't enough because it could still be yours. Somehow we need to help them to make it theirs. And quite ironically, serving God passionately is often the thing that changes it for us. That's when we engage with our faith. Have you ever heard the saying, put your money where your mouth is? Put your money where your mouth is. 
It means don't just say you value something. Actually show that you value it. Show that you love it. And this exposure cannot be complete if we only communicate it to our children or if we only show them the community. We have to live it out passionately. Remember that Lifeway research. Here, here's a recap of things that parents did. They took part in a service project or on a mission trip as a family. They shared their faith with unbelievers. They encouraged the teenagers to serve in church and they taught their children to tithe, to give 10% of their income to God and his church. The Shema didn't just say talk about it. It's a Put it on your hands and on your foreheads. I can see that in no other way that it should be visible in the work I do, in the way I live practically. So as a parent, are you serving? Are you giving generously? Are you sharing your faith passionately? If not, your children is not going to do it. Again, if you ask me today, why am I here as a theology student, by the time I finished my sixth year, our class sat around, and one of the things that, that people in my class said, we have never met anyone as passionate about the church as Louis. And I can't tell you today if I'm the most passionate person about the church. I'm probably not, because Jesus is more passionate about it than I am. But I'm pretty passionate about it. And I'm not just passionate about it because of a year or two of experience. I'm passionate about it because my mom was the organist and my SK year, I joined the choir. Now, it wasn't a kid's choir. It was an adult choir. <laughs> I was singing with them. Then I can remember as a like, grade two, three-year-old playing in the halls that they dug for the foundations of our church. And when there was a work behind the main that work on this new building, I was in there that small painting the ceilings of a little piece in our clock tower in a closet. Work that I could do, but I was there working with them. I visited people in the hospital with my dad. Sometimes I stayed out of school to go with him. And I was there when he prayed for people who were about to pass away. When he prayed for people who needed healing. When I was 16 years old, I didn't just do sound on a mixer. I installed my first sound system that I designed in the church. And I started leading the band. When I was 19 years old, the year after I finished school, our church governance worked a little different than here. We had a church council. I served on the church council at 19 years old. At 22, I started preaching 45 or so Sundays a year at our youth services. And at 26 year old, people say I'm a young senior pastor, at 26 year old I became a lead pastor of a church. I am not here today because of one or two good experiences. I am here because my parents served Jesus faithfully. And they took me along on the journey. They exposed me to it and they gave me opportunities to do it. And the same is true for your children. Your children will not want to miss the church if this is their church. But if it's yours, they will probably rather watch Netflix. So get your kids serving. And I don't care what their age is. There's no age restriction in the Bible. David was on the drums today for the first time. He's 14 years old, grade 9. We don't keep him in the basement for a youth service. He put in the work and he played great for the first time today. There is no age <laughs> restriction. If your kid is grade six, they are old enough to go and run lights and go and run slides and go and set up stuff on their own. If they're younger than grade six, you bring them along. Do what my dad did. If you're preparing coffee, have them carry cups. If you have to greet people at the door, your, your six-year-old is old enough, if they're extrovert like mine, to greet people at the door. <laughs> but take them along. Guys, if you make choices every single day for your family, make the most important choice. And that is to prioritize God in everything you do.
Because as you decide to prioritize him, they will watch you, they will learn from you, you will re- reinforce those behaviors and it will shape them. And you cannot make them follow Jesus. None of us can. But you can help them to gradually over time transfer dependence from away from you, away from themselves and solely onto God. Root your children in God's love and His commandments to give them the best chance of knowing Jesus personally. I want to close with this verse from Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train a child in the way he should go. It doesn't just happen by accident. It's intentionality. It's training And when he or she is old, they will not turn from it. So what's next? What's next is you need to examine your own heart. I need to do it as well. You have to decide to follow Jesus. You have to decide to commit to his body, his church. You need to find your serving spot. And you need to figure out how to spend time with God. You're like, how do I figure that out? Simple. Every Sunday, 11.30, our Next Steps classes. We introduce you to the church. We introduce you to Jesus. We show you where and how you can serve. And today, after the service, I'm going to be helping you to figure out how to read your Bible and pray and share your faith. So join our Next Steps classes. But then if you have a child in church, guys, I want to really ask you to step up your commitment. Okay, our kids' church... In a cycle of three years, every single child from JK to grade eight goes through the Bible in a cycle of three years. So they will have gone through the whole Bible, all the New Testament, a couple of times if they're here every Sunday before the time that they finish elementary school. Every week, Anna does a lot of work to send out a parent guide. That is not to be just a piece of spam in your inbox. It gives you conversations to have with your children so that it becomes the norm in your house. Your children spend hours on screens. We have a free resource for you called Right Now Media. Don't have to pay for it because you're faithful with giving. You get it for free. We'll send out a link in this week. There is a lot of kids' content on there. I put it on for my girls all the time when they, have to, when they want to watch TV. And get them serving. Start asking your children after church what they're passionate about. Start identifying your, the gift and get them serving. Expose them to the right things and you position them in the best possible way to know Jesus. Next week, we're going to be talking about if your children are already copying wrong behavior, how we handle that. And that's coming up next week. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you that it shows us so practically how we can expose our children to you in a way that could lead to them knowing you. I pray, God, that we will be faithful with your commandments, that we will be faithful to your call in our life. I pray that we will be so rooted in Jesus that our children would see your fruit in our lives. I pray for every child who's part of this church, child of every parent watching this message, I pray, God, that you would, that you would reveal yourself to our children. And that our children's passion and love for Jesus will be so much greater than ours ever was. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.